Good evening and welcome to Cedar Pasco Council Workshop Meeting. The Council thanks you for being part of our city government. At workshop meetings, the Council discusses issues, but no formal action is taken. Agenda packets are available on the City of Pasco's website at www.pasco-wa.gov slash agenda. And they can also be found at the back. This meeting is also being televised live on PSEV TV channel 191 on Spectrum Cable in Pasco and Richland and is streamed on the City of Cities Facebook page, website, YouTube channel, and GoToWebinar. This and previous council meeting video is available on City's website. Lastly, the public may submit their comments and or questions by contacting City Manager, City Clerk, or by using the Ask Pasco app. And with that, may I get roll call, please? Council Members Brown? Here. Campos? Here. Milne? Here. Roach? Present. Serrano? Mr. Serrano is um, excused this evening. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Maloney? Present. And Mayor Barajas? Present. Thank you. And with that, would you please join me with the, for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for that. Um, and we will move on to item four, verbal reports from council members, any council members attending any events or meetings and wish to share a little bit of that feedback. Uh, Mr. Brown, yes. Council Member Brown. Um, this um, Saturday, um, I visited um, the Chiawana High School. I'm forgetting the topic here. Yes. Family, poli uh, Pasco Police Family Day. Yes, and Family Day was all of that a family day. It was really nice. They had a lot going on. I got there pretty much towards the end with some other events, but it was it looked so pleasant and so fun and the engagement with the community with the police officers was just really awesome um, so it was a great day so i'm glad to report that that was a successful event at chiawana high school thank you for that uh, mayor Pertem maloney thank you mayor barajas um, i went to the celebration of community diversity and culture that was held um, by the uh, tri cities inclusion and diversity council um, over in um, uh, columbia park in kennewick um, I had an opportunity to hear the uh, Confederated Coldfield Tribes, um, some of their performers um, came down to, to perform. Um, absolutely wonderful as, as we've been able to start inviting them to our events. I think that's been a, a great benefit to the diversity and, and, and enjoyment for, um, for the, the community. And I had an opportunity to talk with some of their the representatives there and just uh, um, um, and I'd ask staff if, they're, if at all possible to, for us to get a little more information on what additional things that they're doing in town. And my understanding is they have um, they're growing their presence on a constant basis, and I'd love to hear more about that. So, um, the other, and the one thing I'll say uh, uh, as follow-up to this is Columbia Park is nice. Um, and I think that one of the things that was, was tough for me is that, that we don't really have a stage like that in Pasco where we can really host an event like that outdoors. And so I know we're talking about our facilities, um, our Parks and Recs facilities, um, and that the master plan is going to that, and that's something that will be coming up as a comment for that is just making sure that we have an opportunity to host some of these live outdoor events and good event space um, in, in our already beautiful parks, either a, either a new park, maybe over on the west side, maybe conjoined with our uh, with a community center, maybe with an aquatics facility, maybe you know maybe it's something that we expand in Volunteer Park, which we're already focusing on the urban forest there. Um, so the shade will be absolutely wonderful. I don't know what the right spot is, but I would very much like to see an opportunity for us to host large-scale outdoor events in, in Pasco. So uh, that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Campos. Uh, nothing on events. Uh, I just wanted to share a little snippet from an email I got. Um, I think this is kind of a cool thing. So uh, this gal has been kind of interacting with me a little bit since she's been following the BFT board stuff. Um, and what she wanted to share was is... Um, Hold on, I lost it. Okay, so since COVID, I, she, has become a city council observer of Kennewick and Richland. And let me tell you, there's no comparison. Pasco Council seeks and strives to listen to citizens' concerns in a fair and honest way. It's diverse, therefore many points of view are presented and evaluated for the good of all. Um, 
earlier in the comments, she made it that she's super proud of, of her city council. So it's just nice to see, you know, somebody taking ownership of that and recognizing the work that we do. And I just wanted to share that with you guys. Thank you for sharing that. I do want to add a little bit uh, from this weekend's events. I did attend the family day over at Giovanna High School. Um, it was a, an event geared towards um, community and bringing families together and participating in, in just really family enjoyment. Um, there was there was resources out there, um, you know, everything from foster care information to face painting to the debut of Pasco Cares Foundation's uh, popsicle cart. So there were some pictures on social media. Um, Chief was out there uh, passing out free popsicles um, to all the children. There was bounce houses. There was uh, uh, competitions, a kickball competition with the police officers. It was just so much fun. A lot of the feedback was families had missed out on um, you know being out there in the community and just really grateful on how the police department, our officers, engage with kids and the community itself. So just wanted to share a little bit more on that. I did not make it to uh, Kennewick side. It was a long day. <laughs> uh, but, you know, thank you everyone that participates and is out there um, putting your best foot forward. And again, the comments like uh, Councilman Campo shared, it's, it's about being in the community. It's about seeing what the community needs and then making sure those needs are being met. Thanks again. Um, with that, we'll move on to item five, items for discussion um, A. We do have a presentation, Parks and Rec Master Plan Update, Director Ratkai. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Madam Mayor and uh, members of council. Yeah, good evening. This is our third installment of our updates to council, where uh, MIG Consulting and John Fenis in particular will be uh, presenting just an update on the Parks and Rec Master Plan. Uh, we've been diligently working on it. Uh, it's a little bit delayed, should be ready this fall, but uh, we're excited to see some of the feedback that's come out from the community and how it's incorporated into uh, uh, just various tenets of the plan and sections. We are going to be providing an update on the project schedule and progress this evening, outcomes of the most recent community outreach activities, uh, some priority improvements, and then uh, some draft plan elements and review processes to the council. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to uh, John from MIG Consulting, and I will work the slideshow from here. All right. Thank you, Zach. Uh, good evening, uh, council members. My name is John Finis. I'm a project manager with MIG consultant team and um, very excited to share with you tonight some updates on what we've been doing and um, get your feedback on on what happens next. So let's get going. Uh, Zach, you can move to the next slide. So an overview tonight, we'll bring you up to speed on what we've done. I know the last time we presented was back in January, so we've done a lot of work since then. Uh, tonight, I really want to talk about all of that input that we've heard. I know uh, we just mentioned listening to the community, identifying what those needs are. And so that's what we're doing tonight is reporting back on um, the needs, but also the big picture vision. This is a long-term plan. This is a 20-year plan for PASCO. So we're looking not just, you know, five years from now, we're looking long-term. So it's very important to share what we've heard from the community for that longer-term vision. Part of that is also what the priorities are. Uh, everybody has an opinion. We've heard all sorts of different ideas for the parks and recreation system. Uh, so it's really important to start diving into specific priorities. Finally, we'll talk about next steps in the planning process. So project outcomes, if you remember, uh, we've, uh, again, this is our third uh, meeting with you all tonight. But the reason we're doing this, this project is because parks and recreation and trails and open space, those are all very important parts of uh, PASCO, a very important part of the quality of life. And so to have a plan for those features, for those amenities is extremely important. So part of that is uh, inventorying existing conditions, looking at community needs and priorities, we're talking about that tonight, the vision, the goals, uh, what does the community want to see, what does the council want to see, and then recommend recommendations and direction for the future. Some of these are very specific parts of what the state of Washington 
wants to see in plans so that the city of Pasco is competitive with grant funding. Uh, next slide. So the planning process, uh, we are now squarely on our way to the last phase, phase four. So we started uh, a year ago, summer of 2021, documented conditions, began our public outreach process. I'll show you a little bit more about what that entailed. Um, and then basically from this winter through the spring up until now, we've been documenting those priorities and actually getting into specific projects, costs, funding mechanisms, and so forth uh, to create an action plan um, for this long range plan. So I'm going to share with you a little bit more about that. And then when I close the presentation, I'll explain a little bit more about what happens next. So community engagement to date, uh, Zach mentioned that um, we've had a few different delays. And the, the big reason for that is we started the project in the middle of the pandemic. And I'm not blaming the pandemic on, on that, but we did spend extra time listening to community members. So we had a number of different opportunities you can see listed here. And in each one, we wanted to make sure we had that open as long as possible to hear from as many people as we could. So, so far, a number of, of online and in-person opportunities to hear from folks. This image on the right was uh, just back in May. We were at Road 36 soccer fields, uh, just providing information, hearing from folks. Uh, this is my colleague, Alfonso, a Spanish speaker. So we uh, wanted to make sure we were uh, providing English and Spanish. Everything we did, uh, the surveys were both English and Spanish. So very inclusive. We know that's important. Um, and so that's what we wanted to accomplish here. So we've done a lot. The goal is not to have one particular uh, instrument or opportunity to hear from the community. It's to have several and to layer those all on top of you know, another so we can really find out what does the community want to see. Uh, next slide. So a little bit about what we've done, uh, but perhaps most importantly is who we've heard from. Uh, we know that Pasco is a diverse community. Uh, we know that there are all sorts of age groups. We know that there are all sorts of demographics. So uh, from the results of all that we've done so far, we've heard from a wide cross section of the community. Uh, so I just wanted to list some of those folks here. Uh, partners are also a big part of parks and recreation in Pasco. So the county, the port, federal state agencies, uh, those are all important aspects of this project. So we've been involving uh, all sorts of different stakeholders as well through this process. Next slide. So I want to talk about what we've heard. I think back in January, we, we were just starting to share some of the information we had been collecting. Uh, so now we've compiled all of that, put that all together, and have all sorts of information on what community needs are. Um, and it's been incredible. I think the first survey we had over 900 responses the second we had over 750 uh, so really tremendous uh, support to to find out what what folks are interested in seeing and it's varied of course no two people think alike no two neighborhoods in pasco have the same needs or issues or opportunities uh, but we start to see some themes emerging and a couple of these are the interest in active sports. And this encompasses everything from organized sports, soccer, baseball, softball. Um, but in particular, this survey, this image I'm showing here, showing results of our first survey we had in 2021. So interest in active, uh, you know, get, getting outside, uh, staying fit, being healthy. But you can see the next highest percent is uh, being outside, being close to nature. We know that's important as well. And there are lots of other elements uh, about this, but just some kind of some high level uh, parts of this. Uh, next slide. So we asked a lot of questions around what people value, what are some of the things they wanna see? And as I mentioned, Pasco is a diverse community. Uh, it's also geographically very diverse uh, from downtown to new growth areas. There are different opportunities and challenges throughout, throughout the city. So we did a lot of map-based analysis to kind of find out more about what's going on uh, on the ground. And so this graphic shows some of the mapping we did looking at uh, a convenient walk distance to a park. Uh, and so the yellow or the orange show a close proximity to a park. So basically, if you're thinking about a 10-minute walk to get to a park, if you're in that yellow or orange area, you have great access. And so conversely, if you're outside of that in the gray area, uh, really a little bit harder to get to a park. There may be a busy street 
there may not be anything at all. And so that's really where we started to focus in on is what's going on in those, those areas that are underserved. Uh, next slide. We also looked at equity. Uh, equity is a lens that we use throughout this process, both in terms of the outreach and the analysis uh, for this plan. And so we looked at a number of different demographic and socioeconomic indicators uh, to help us understand what's going on on the ground. Uh, and so this is census information to help us show big picture areas that really have the greatest need in terms of equity. So the darker green shapes are generally areas that are more demographically diverse. This combines that previous map where neighborhoods don't have really great access to a nearby park uh, and other factors that help us really start to, to hone in on where, where do we need to look, where do we need to prioritize. Uh, next slide. So the vision, um, a lot of words on here, uh, but what I wanted to do is highlight what those key themes are, how do we put this all together and, and what have we heard uh, from the community as where we want to head 10, 20 years from now. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of elements of the, the longer vision. Um, but first and foremost, it's a comprehensive system. It's equitable and accessible. Uh, we heard a lot about community health and livability. Uh, people go right to parks, recreation programming, trails. Uh, we heard that louder than ever during the pandemic when people really didn't have uh, many outlets in Parks in Pasco were a great opportunity to get outside. Uh, streets, trails, those are all big parts of the system. Uh, you know, obviously there's a separate uh, street division. There's a transportation system master plan, but we also incorporated recommendations from streets, off street trails into this plan. So safe connections, safety to parks, to schools, downtown, to the river and so on. Linkages to the river and the region, responding to community needs. Obviously, we talked a lot about that. And then some important ones that are here uh, listed at the last statement is excellent communication and an involved community. Um, a lot of the feedback we heard was um, folks that have lived in Pasco for years and years or, or folks that maybe just moved here. Uh, they, they love the city in, the, in which they live. They love parks and recreation. And so communication is extremely important both to share uh, information about what's going on, you know, events, a new park opening, uh, but also to hear about concerns, you know, what's what's going on in the community and what are some opportunities that we want to consider. Uh, next slide. So with that, I want to get to priorities. Uh, the goals of identifying future priorities are listed here. So again, we heard from thousands of people, everybody has an idea. Um, so what we want to do is to start narrowing down what what is really critical, what's most important. And to do that, we had a number of different activities uh, to hear feedback and to show trade-offs. We can't have everything. Some things are more expensive than others. Some will take a lot longer to achieve than others. So we had to show um, that, that trade-off. Uh, so comparing trade-offs with resources and then identify locations, costs, and phasing, obviously key parts of the plan. Uh, next slide. So I've got just a couple of slides I wanted to highlight for where we are now. Uh, these all highlight what projects we will be focusing in on. Uh, so by the next time we meet, we'll have specific projects that basically follow along with what these general priorities are. Uh, the first one I list here is support for programming. And that's programming of all types. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, community events um, uh, perhaps being missing here in Pasco, having a an event venue, a stage, so forth. Um, but I have highlighted on this slide three of the top recreation priorities we've heard from the community. Uh, so we talked about the need for activities, an active parks and rec system. So youth sports and fitness related programs being a highlight. Year round opportunities, uh, something to do at night during the winter. Uh, you know, it's not always nice outside. So making sure there are opportunities year round. And then aquatics classes and programs. Um, very pleased to hear that uh, there was a successful bond measure since we met last in January. So very exciting, opening up a lot of doors for recreation programming opportunities. Uh, next slide. Investment in existing parks. Uh, Pasco has a, a very large park system in terms of the number of different park types, developed parks, special facilities and so forth. Uh, but not all parts of Past have 
brand new parks with brand new play areas and, and so on. So we heard a lot about, hey, I've got a park down the street. It needs a little TLC. Can we invest in improvements to existing parks? So some specifics around that that we heard is a big priority, uh, shade. Uh, not a lot of shade in some parks, so adding some shade structures, but also considering um, climate change, drought tolerance, uh, and, and with landscaping, irrigation, water use. Uh, play areas being very important. We've heard from a lot of families, so updated play areas, places to gather, uh, picnicking, community events, just being out with friends and families. Those are the, one of the top activities we've heard about. So having um, more opportunities for that, but also quality, well-maintained uh, new facilities to enjoy. Uh, next slide. And then the last one I wanted to highlight is new parks and facilities. We know that Pasco is growing tremendously. Uh, there are new growth areas, parks are going in. Um, it feels like every other day I'll get an email from Brent about a new park that's uh, coming in. So there's a lot of change happening, uh, but also a lot of interest from those neighborhoods wanting to see more trails, more parks, and so forth. But there's also an opportunity to connect with some of the things that make Pasco, Pasco so amazingly unique, and that's the river, access to the river. So one of the top priorities, I'd say probably number one priority we heard was a continuous public waterfront. Uh, so all along the Columbia River with connections to riverfront parks, to downtown, those were definitely uh, a, a top priority. A community scale play area, uh, now, this is something that you wouldn't necessarily find at a neighborhood park, but this is something that you would find downtown, for example, or a, a brand new large scale community park where you have a, a sizable, interesting, interactive play area that's community scale. So anybody from all over the city can come enjoy uh, using it. And then parks and new growth areas. One of the big park parts of this plan, one of the most important parts is to help guide where new parks and facilities and trails are located. So we are working on that currently to identify locations and quantity of new parks and park types and new growth areas. Uh, next slide. Uh, just two more slides I wanted to highlight. Uh, one is kind of going back to location. So those were kind of citywide priorities. But if we think about the different areas of Pasco, uh, North Pasco, West, Central, and East, there is a little bit of variety. And this slide is um, kind of a higher level summary of what we heard from the last survey. We had over 700 responses to that survey. And of course, not everybody lives in the same neighborhood, which is great. So that tells us that we heard from all different parts of the city. So these are showing priorities based on those neighborhoods. So in North Pasco, you can see a lot of interest in new parks and trails. A greater variety in uh, existing parks. West Pasco, same thing, having some more variety in, in parks, play areas, uh, you know, more things to do. And then you can see some commonalities in Central and East Pasco. Uh, a lot more focus on, hey, let's take care of what we have, uh, more repair, replacing aging facilities and features, more maintenance, and so forth. So some commonalities, but also important to highlight where do we need to focus these improvements based on a specific location in Pasco? So one more slide on priorities is more of the policy level framework. Um, equally as important as the, the new parks and the facilities and the improvements is improving the strategy for providing parks and recreation. So Pasco does not exist alone. The city obviously relies on a lot of partners really great partners, provide a lot of pretty incredible opportunities. Um, so the school district, Corps of Engineers, the county, um, these are all parts of the puzzle. So we have recommendations that we'll be sharing on improving and strengthening and continuing those relationships. Operations and maintenance funding, a uh, key part of this plan is to help guide the city with how are we gonna pay for this and how are we gonna maintain it? We can have all the parks in the world, but it won't matter if we don't have the funding to maintain and operate it. So we will have a, a maintenance and operations plan that accompanies all the projects so that the city is, is guided in how this will take place over the next 20 years and beyond. And then the last one I wanted to highlight 
is updated standards and guidelines. And there are a couple of parts to this, but the main ones being some of the most important parts of what the city does is uh, SDCs, land dedication. And when land comes in, it's critical that new parks conform to what is in the plan. What the city wants to see should be taking place on the ground. And so that's part of what we're providing in the plan is updated standards and guidelines for new parks and facilities. And then I think there's one more slide after this one. So the next steps, uh, again, this is, I uh, wanted to give you a big picture of what we've been doing, uh, but the next meeting we'll have, you'll have the complete draft plan in front of you. You'll have a chance to review that. Uh, specifically, uh, what you'll be looking for is the complete picture, the whole story from existing conditions to community needs, to priorities, funding, and phasing. So uh, those will all be detailed in the draft plan. There will be several opportunities for the community to review this public draft. So we'll have uh, some opportunities to review the plan before the next draft. And we also have um, the master plan advisory committee we've been meeting with. We'll meet with them to discuss the plan, any changes they'd like to see in that, uh, as well as the parks and rec advisory committee. And so by the time uh, we present uh, to the council, we'll have the draft plan with uh, some comments from these review bodies as part of the, the plan process. So I, I know that was a, a little long-winded. I think uh, that's what I have for the presentation, but I'd be happy to, to take any comments or questions. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, do we have any questions from the council? Mayor, uh, Mayor Portamaloni. Thank you, Mayor Barajas, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I can tell a lot of hard work's going into this, and especially I, I really appreciate the, uh, the emphasis on, on bra broad and diverse outreach. Um, obviously, we, that's something that we're really focused on as a council. Um, a few questions for you. Um, on the um, kind of heat map sort of, well, the heat map, I guess, uh, for distance from a park, I, I had a couple of questions. I was, there's some things that I didn't, I'm not sure I understood well. Um, it looks like um, Edgar Brown Stadium and Sun Willows Golf Course are indicated as public parks, but I guess I, I know Edgar Brown Stadium is is um, is locked um, a lot of the time. So I'm not sure I'm, I'm not sure if that's really um, much of a public facility that would be counted for a, for a regional park. And and I honestly do not know if Sun Willows Golf Course is a park or not. I, I would ask for advice on that. I've never heard of anyone walking there, but then again, I don't live over there, so I wouldn't do it myself. Uh, can, I, can I get some thoughts on, on what was counted in here and why certain facilities were counted as part of the, uh, the public park process for this? Yeah, yeah, great question. Uh, obviously, this presentation has some snippets of more uh, mapping and analysis that we did, uh, but that particular map that I had in this presentation was showing access to all, uh, all parks and facilities, so neighborhood parks, community parks, golf course, uh, you know, sports complexes that may or may not be open all the time to the public. We also had another heat map that just showed developed parks, so neighborhood parks, community parks, and it actually winnows away those, you know, walk sheds quite a bit when you start to remove all public parks. But that's a that's a great point. So we did factor in kind of how are parks used into that analysis. Okay, great. And it was a point, and I think it, was a, it ties into a point you made. Um, and plus part of your presentation that we have a lot of different types of parks um, and their uses are um, maybe are certainly not uniform I right, appreciate that um, and then the other question I had in terms of prioritize, prioritization that kind of related to this map is walkability is one thing but then um, when we look at population density that's another big portion of it of how many you know kids are going to be in the area or how many people are, are going to be you know served by those parks um, is that was that accounted in for some of your with, with your recommendations it is, yeah. So we had an, uh, the one green map, if you remember the, the equity, uh, park equity map, we had uh, five indicators that we used, and I can just quickly list those. So residential density was one of those. So that was based on, um, uh, again, the census information that we had. Also communities of color, which is the non-white population, uh, percent low income, uh, percent uh, higher percentage of youth population, and then again, the areas that are outside of that. 10 minute walk but yeah residential density was calculated in that uh that factor all right i appreciate that uh just i think one more question for you um when i'm looking at the vision and i'm looking at some of the priorities and, and other items um you know can you talk to me about large-scale facilities um in our community 
um, you know, um, I brought up as, as one of the prior to this 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 item, I talked a little bit about you know, potentially the the need for an outdoor amphitheater, which I think ties in well to some of the community feedback in terms of you know large gathering spaces and such. Um, um, we we have the Hapo Center. We've been talking about building community center, um, and I'm and uh, we talked about re rebuilding or, or renovating um, our uh, Martin Luther King um, um, Center over mm -hmm. um, just off of Oregon Avenue. Um, so some of the, I, but I don't see a lot of words in here about some of those those these facilities, which are of course some of the most expensive facilities um, in our that that we uh, we uh, we own for public use. So can can you talk a little bit about how those do or do not engage with this? master planning process yeah that's a that's a great point and that again as a draft vision that might be something we can can add to is the scale because there's definitely what we heard is a range of it's nice to have a local neighborhood park but i also like to go to a big event or you know something where the entire community is out there so we did hear quite a bit of that in the specific recommendations that we have we do have recommendations for the larger community uh, facilities the indoor uh, recreation center is obviously a big part of that so those those will come through in the more detailed uh recommendations for the plan but i think you make a good point about articulating that in the vision to say that they're these you know community scale facilities versus this the more local serving that are really important i appreciate that and, and of course a, um, a particular interest for us lately is the uh, the hapo center um and i'm not sure if that falls within this master plan or it would, it would fall in better under economic development and I'd look over to staff to see if there's a recommendation. I don't want to force something that shouldn't be in here into here so I'm not recommending that but I'd be interested in your thoughts. Yeah, I think we, we can certainly have discussion on it internally. Um, Hapo Center being a county facility I think it was uh, left off a little bit from here but certainly it's a facility within our economic development and, and in our area so we, we can certainly uh, have that discussion with our team uh, for this final phase. Great. And if it's not appropriate here, um, do not we're not trying to ask for it to be force fit. If it's better as an economic development driver as instead, um, I'd love to have a conversation with that separately if that's the appropriate spot. So we can definitely explore that. Okay. Final thing for me is I really want a zip line to Kennewick and Richland. So please add that here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any further comments? Well, looks like there's no more comments. I do want to point out though, uh, looking at your presentation uh, the, I just lost it on my agenda the um, where there was a dot and uh, people's feedback giving you uh, putting a dot on um, on asks I guess it would be the majority of the concentration and it's in Spanish I know this but the majority of the concentration is looking for shelter uh, picnic areas and you know more like family gathering um, under under shelter really um, so that's that's good to see that the community is is providing their feedback especially communities that uh, like to get together in large gatherings and share food <laughs> thank you thank you for that so we'll move along in our agenda again thank you for thank the you. presentation appreciate that uh, we'll move along to item B um, single room occupancy, uh, housing moratorium discussion, uh, director. Okay. Mr. Ferguson. Great. Thanks. Yeah. I'll just start us off with the kind of the legal uh, background and then uh, we'll have uh, Mr. Gonzalez come up and actually get into the, the meat of it. But, uh, um, essentially, uh, we're at a point now we, uh, back in March of uh, 2022, uh, earlier this year, we passed resolution uh, 4158, which put a six month moratorium on single room occupancy, uh, portion of our code. Uh, we uh, did that only for six months. We did not do it for the full year. Uh, the full year would have required us to ad also adopt a uh, formal work plan. So um, we have a little more flexibility because we want the six month version uh, to uh, study this uh, essentially as we see fit and as we're going along. So really um, where we're at tonight is we're about a month out uh, from uh, this uh, getting to its expiration. Uh, so we want to uh, get uh, back to you and, and find out, uh, get some more direction and make sure we're uh, spending this, uh, this time uh, talking about the developments, the things that have happened, but as, uh, as well as making sure that we're coming back to you before. Uh, we are in a little bit of a different situation this time around. Uh, uh, the first time we were able to pass a moratorium, 
And then the statute says that within 60 days, uh, you have to have a, a public hearing and then uh, adopt findings. Uh, this is a little different. Now we have to do our public hearing and adopt our findings prior to the extension. So um, at this point, uh, that's why we need to get going on our public hearing notice if the council decides that uh, they do want to pursue uh, extending that. Uh, now's the time to, to get us working on that so that we can make sure we get our notice published properly, uh, get our public hearing, and then are able to adopt findings uh, consistent with what the council uh, needs to uh, needs to have uh, for the next six months. Um, the uh, just a quick update, and I think Mr. Gonzalez knows a lot more about uh, what, kind of what's going on in the area. Obviously, there's been a few higher profile uh, examples that uh, folks have been talking about, and I did want to distinguish just a little bit about the difference between where we're at and where some of those others, uh, other uh, local municipalities were. Uh, both the, the city of Richland and the port of Kennewick had uh, two uh, particular uh, examples uh, where they were. Uh, there was a potential for the single room occupancy uh, developments to occur. Uh, in both of those situations, the municipal uh, corporations were also the underlying landowner. So uh, we're a little different in that we don't, uh, we don't own the land uh, that we're trying to regulate. In this case, we're a pure regulator, uh, and uh, this deals with our, our zoning code, uh, not uh, necessarily anything to do with any particular property where uh, when you're the owner, you have a lot more say about what uh, can and can't uh, be used uh, uh, on the property above it. So um, we're not in that situation, but um, we're still um, in need of uh, getting some direction from council. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor uh, and members of the council. Uh, just here to answer any questions I can with regards to the context of single room occupancy uh, uh, units or SROs uh, within the context of our uh, uh, very soon to begin housing action and implementation plan. Um, as mentioned on page two of the uh, staff report, um, there's a list of bullet points about the particulars that would be relevant for the study of SROs and just want to reiterate that those are pretty key uh, factors that will be uh, addressed regardless in our housing action plan regarding all, ho all housing types, uh, re regardless if they're single family detached dwellings, <clears throat> apartments, duplexes, or potentially single room occupancy housing. So I just want to emphasize that those particular three um, uh, bullet points will be uh, a part of our housing action and implementation plan. But happy to answer any questions um, I can this evening about it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Ferguson. Any questions from council? Or yes, Deputy Mayor uh, Maloney. Thank you, Mayor Brahas, and, and, and thank you, uh, Mr. Ferguson and Mr. Gonzalez for, for kicking this off. Um, I'm supportive of continuing the moratorium until we have a better um, set of information in front of us. Um, I know there's been a lot to do about, I think, one of the Richland properties, or I think it was one of the Richland properties that is moving forward. And um, when the rates um, or suspected rates, I'm not sure if they were rumored or, or, or actual, um, of, of what that was going to cost for one of these units was um, was pretty impactful to the community. That was uh, not well received. That was, you know, people felt like they were being told this was going to be affordable housing and the prices did not seem affordable to a lot of folks. So I'm still interested in seeing how this, this falls in the mix, um, understanding that, um, you know, that there, there's, there's a lot of moving parts and we will know more soon. I think that's, that's prudent to, to, to maintain this moratorium for this, for, for this period of time and see what we, what we know in six months. Um, the question I have for you, um, Mr. Gonzalez, is um, what more do we know since our moratorium was originally passed um, in terms of community and of like when what ha what else has happened do we do we do you have an initial impression of what's happened in um, around the tri cities for for units that are similar to what we were um, would have a moratorium I, I don't believe there's been any other actions taken or um, or developments that have been proposed um, other than what uh, uh, Eric Ferguson had mentioned um, so they're kind of stagnant right now um, and particularly in Pasco with the moratorium in place and the last question is, we have three um, permits that, conditional use permits that have been issued already. Um, do we know how those are proceeding? Are, are they proceeding? Yes, I, I believe one is in progress. Uh, that would be the uh, location off of Oregon Avenue, just south of Highway 12. Um, and I believe the other two, I don't believe there's been any movement on them. The special permits have been approved, um, but no actual building permits have, have uh, been applied for by the applicants. Is, is there a sunset date for those uh, perm those conditional use permits? Yeah, I, I believe it's um, five or seven years, um, but I can confirm so that number. It's with an you. extended yeah. period of time. It's yeah. not, a, not like you know, Yeah, the permit thing. will okay. expire. Okay, great. That's all I have. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Okay. Well, I, I feel I'm not opposed to 
Um, actually, I'm leaning towards uh, extending the moratorium just so that we can get more information, more data, um, and be, be able to give act actual accurate information to the community and those um, that wish to apply for this permits. I was just going to comment that, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. I was going to comment that I also agree with Councilman Maloney that we should extend it. I think that's the right decision at this time. Thank you. I just have one question, Mayor. Um, the bullet points that are listed uh, above suggested ac actions and options for the council, are those planned uh, planned um, tasks that staff are going to be pursuing in the interim as the moratorium continues, um, regardless of decision, or is staff looking for direction from council on those bullet points? Uh, I think the answer would, would be both. We're certainly going to take a look at all housing types um, and, and housing related policies in our housing action plan. I do want to mention that the uh, completion of that housing action plan is likely to be uh, this time next year. Um, so it's about a year or so from now until that plan is, is um, ready for hopeful, a hopeful adoption. Obviously, we'll present that in incremental um, pieces to Council and the Planning Commission. Um, but we are a year from a final uh, draft. I'm sorry, a final, yeah, a final draft of the housing action plan being ready uh, for a decision. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Yeah, I, I guess if I could, you know, what data exactly are we looking at? If staff puts an action plan out and just says we have a recommended baseline of two or three units of SROs with this, you know, density recommendation, is that sufficient data for the rest of council? to see or are you looking at I feel like you're looking at more qualitative data in terms of what the impact for the city is not not recommendations from staff as far as what number of SROs we should have am I on the right track here is that what the rest of council wants I would certainly want more than than just um, a recommended number of units or such in the as part of the mix yes I'd want to know more about the, the why what it, what's the impact how does it affect like we, we discussed when we first passed the moratorium we had a lot of questions I just, I just want to make sure, because I thought at this point, I thought we'd have at least some sort of data presented to us by the time we extended our moratorium. So I, I'm kind of, you know, Zara, Councilwoman Roach made a great point at our retreat. You know, we made, we all agreed uh, setting our city council goals to make sure that homelessness was addressed. And this seemed like a tool at the time to, to do it. And, and I'm still leaning towards this as a viable action because I don't have any data for or against. And all the data that was presented when we established the SRO leaned towards it being a favorable recommendation. And I, I still default back to that. But I just want to make sure that when and if that action plan comes back to us, it doesn't kick, kick down the road. I want it to be the only time we look at it and we move on it. So I want to make sure that council's requests are being heard and incorporated into the action plan so we can get it going. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Thank you for that, Councilman Campos. Oh, no further comment. So we'll move on to item C on, on the agenda, intent for annexation, the Al Alford Coal Annexation, and we have Director White or Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you, and uh, good evening again, Mayor and members of Council. Um, this is an item on a recent application uh, from the owners of properties located east of Caltrail Road, uh, approximately half mile east of Road 68 and about a quarter mile north of Burns Road. Uh, the total site area is approximately 20 acres, comprising of two 10-acre parcels. Uh, the owners have submitted a notice of intent to commence annexation, uh, which has been reviewed by staff in our legal department. And the notice of intent is sufficient to initiate the annexation process. And as Director White has mentioned, I think numerous times over the past couple of years, that the annexation process is kind of a, a two-step process. One is to accept the initiation, and the other is to move forward with the proposed annexation. Um, so the next date to consider a resolution commencing the annexation process would be August 15th. And i um, happy to answer any questions I can about this proposal. Thank you. Any questions, Mr. Compos? Thank you. Um, was this parcel of property the property that the rest of the people in that area wanted excluded from the annexation and now they want it included? No. no okay. No. I just wanted my memory refreshed is all. Thank you. 
Thank you for that. Um, any further questions or comments? No further comments. So I guess we expect to see that in our next agenda. So moving on, uh, item D, Pasco Public Facilities District updates, Director Ratkai. Yeah, I just wanted to provide some quick updates um, from an operational standpoint, and then I believe uh, City Attorney Ferguson will provide uh, uh, some more in-depth legal updates. But as, as we all know, the Pasco Public Facilities District uh, successfully passed their bond issue on April 26th um, to begin uh, the sales tax uh, collection for the future aquatic center. Um, so ironing out some of the timing there, uh, sales tax collection would not commence until J January 1st of 2023 uh, with payments to the PFD uh, most likely after the first quarter, so around April 1st of 2023. So city staff has been working on just determining that timing and outlining just some of the operational parameters with the PFD. Um, this has included working on a draft budget. Uh, obviously, the community is very excited about this project. Uh, the PFD is very excited about this project. Um, so the PFD has requested uh, to begin work in earnest as quickly as possible. Um, so we're working on a draft budget, helping them along with that to determine if there is a need for uh, uh, assistance from the city of Pasco to help them get things started. Namely, one of the biggest areas is recruitment and uh, onboarding of an executive director or someone that would work directly for the PFD board, um, which would sort of transition staff here at the city into more of a support role at that point. Uh, obviously, payment uh, of salary to an executive director, whether it's through contract or direct employment, is certainly a consideration. So we consider that in the draft budget. Um, but even at the, prior to the completion of 2022, community engagement, even a little bit of design could also conceivably take place as well. So really trying to iron out all the parameters and, and operational uh, possibilities that the PFD could have um, as we look at that. So we look at the ramping up the staffing for the public facilities district, someone to manage this project, um, manage the board and, and act as that liaison to city staff here at City Hall. And um, significant work on bylaws and charter updates. So I think that's my basic introduction and turn it over to uh, Mr. Ferguson. Great, thank you. Yeah, so uh, uh, some, some of you folks uh, now have been here uh, long enough to, we've amended this thing, uh, their, their charter for the uh, Public Facilities District a few times now. Um, it, it's uh, a little bit unique because charters are typically uh, essentially the constitution for a particular organization. So those don't uh, change very often. So it seems like we've been doing that quite a bit for this. Uh, but uh, it's been necessary because, uh, as I stated before, we had a PFD that was uh, pretty much 20th century, and we're trying to kind of bring it into the 21st century now. So um, with that being said, obviously, we've got the ballot pro proposition that's moved forward. Uh, we've communicated all of that to Department of Revenue. Um, so that they're aware that uh, obviously uh, they, they track it on their end as well, but uh, we want to make sure that they're aware of the, uh, the upcoming change uh, to, the, uh, to the tax structure in, in the city of Pasco for sales and use tax. Uh, the, the next step uh, that we really uh, need to get going forward on with regard to the PFD is, as uh, Mr. Radka was referring to, is really related to this idea of uh, employees or uh, contracting. Uh, and in our charter, uh, the, or, or in the PFD's charter, uh, there's a provision uh, that states that they um, uh, they can they may use uh, the city staff for their uh, support staff, but they may not employ or contract uh, without council approval. Uh, now I'll be frank and tell you that I don't know that that's totally legal um, because uh, they uh, PFDs have a lot of uh, abilities to be able to uh, contract, and they have uh, innate powers that are that are. Uh, outlined in uh, 3557, or should it be 3557. So uh, regardless, uh, we need to get it changed. Uh, uh, whether it's legal or not doesn't matter. Uh, at the end of the day, it needs to be, I noted, don't quote me on that. Um, but uh, uh, don't take that out of context. Uh, but the uh, at the end of the day, what we need to do is we need to get it fixed. And uh, so uh, that's uh, part of the process why we're here. Uh, as some of you might re recall from our uh, previous uh, amendments, 
uh, there's three different ways we can do this. The, the PFD can ask the council to make some certain amendments, but that requires a 30-day process. Uh, the other way is if the law requires us to make an amendment, uh, if there's been a change, uh, for example, a piece of legislation at the state level has passed that we need to immediately amend it, we can do it that way. Or the third option, which is what we've utilized over and over again, is the ability for council on its own initiative to make these changes. So uh, that would be my preferred uh, method to, to move forward. Uh, but essentially what we really need to do is be able to get uh, the PFD to be able to adopt their own bylaws. Uh, and bylaws are much more similar to like statutes uh, than, than constitutions are much more uh, um, amendable. Uh, so we need the PFD to be able to set their own rules for uh, things that are much more specific. I will be honest and tell you though, our charter is quite uh, uh, particular in, in terms of dense of uh, the uh, direction. Uh, that's why there's never really been a need for the bylaws because the charter is pretty uh, expansive in its uh, direction uh, for what they're supposed to be doing. So uh, we need to shift some of those things out of the charter. We need to get them over into the bylaw category so that the, the PFD can uh, start to do some of the things that they need to do to move forward with their project, obviously. Um, but uh, there's a big uh, caveat in that there's nothing that they can put in their bylaws that are in uh, contradiction to the charter. So uh, that's why we're here. Uh, we've got uh, some changes. Uh, I told you about, uh, obviously, uh, the largest change. Some of the things uh, will we'll need to stay in the charter uh, with regard to officers and roles and those types of things, uh, quorum and, and uh, Robert's Rules of Order, those types of things. Uh, but then as we move over into the bylaws category, we'll try to shift some of those things. Um, and... Um, but they shouldn't uh, be a substantive. They'll be uh, things that the, the really, quite frankly, uh, the charter shouldn't be addressing uh, anyway. So uh, with that, I guess I just need some direction from council um, about how, what process. I didn't want to be presumptuous and, and assume that uh, council would be willing to uh, take these uh, changes up on their own, but uh, I certainly would appreciate some direction so that we uh, can communicate that back to the, uh, to the board because I know they're getting antsy and, and they're ready to get going with their bylaws. Good. Any questions or comments? Councilwoman Roach. Just a comment for this council is we could proceed forth with a amendment to the charter. That's my suggestion. And I see several non, so I think that's the way we're going to go. Great. Uh, so I, they won't be uh, too significant, uh, so uh, we can turn those around and have those back to you uh, next week. Uh, if that's enough time, uh, certainly uh, there's no requirement to move on those next week, but I don't think that you'll find that they're uh, significant enough to not be able to address next week. But if you do, uh, we certainly have that option. I just didn't want it, uh, to rush it, but we do have another meeting. I'd like to uh, be able to get some direction back to the board. Um, okay. So if, if uh, next meeting would work, we can have those to you. City manager. So good evening, Mayor Council. Just uh, one other comment on the, on the interim financing needs. Uh, the first check, I believe, uh, that the PPFT, the Pasco Public Facilities District, will see will be April, early April of next year. And as uh, Director Reck, I said, there's one, one, we want to help them get staffed up, you know, just because they deserve that. They, they need that kind of support, and we, we really can't give it to them, given all that's going on in our city business, you know. So... We're already pretty stretched to try to do that. And then two, uh, and probably equally, if not more important, is we want to get this thing moving forward. Uh, uh, and with uh, with an interim director, uh, interim executive director in there, uh, be able to start that engagement process. Uh, hopefully, maybe even be able to start some, as, as uh, Director Eck, I said, preliminary design. That's going to take some money. We're going to have to do an RFP and, and hire a, a qualified firm to assist them and, and uh, uh, it'd be it'd be kind of a shame to wait until uh, early next year to start that kind of work. And so I think we can get a jump start in the project about six months or so if we can start doing that now. And then I'd, I would um, just add that uh, we're probably looking on the order of a million dollars would be my guess to, to be able to pay for some engineering, some outreach, and uh, salary. Some six six eight months salary between now and then. Mayor for Maloney. Thank you, um, Mayor Brahas, and thank you, Mr. Zabel, for bringing that up. Um, in terms of how we would look at funding that, this would be um, a kind of an intergovernmental loan 
Is that the idea that they would eventually pay us back with the proceeds they have from the sales tax? That's correct. Yeah. Okay, so we, this wouldn't be a, a grant, as it were, where we're paying for this up front and we never see the money again, but we're, that would be, excuse me, that would be paid back to the city over time. Yeah, good like question. I, I meant to bring that up. I was not suggesting a loan, so. We have a good uh, general fund reserve uh, balance, but uh, we want to keep it as much as we can. So. I, I, I don't see Chief Gear standing right here. It might be online, but I know he's looking for all that money he can get. Yeah, so. that's right. Yeah. A lot of needs for it. All right. Any further questions? And, and to be comments? clear, I'd be very, I'd be, I'm supportive of, of moving forward on a loan if we have the ability for, and they obviously will have the final financial wherewithal to pay that back. So thank you. Any further questions? Looks like we're moving forward. Thank you. Our next item on the agenda, item E, Resolution Process Water Reuse Facility Phase 2, Amendment Number 3 with RH2 Engineering, Director Worley. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of Council. I'm going to turn this item over to our Capital Improvement Program Manager, Maria Serra. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. We are presenting to you a third amendment to our Professional Services Agreement for PWRF Phase 2 improvements. If you remember, this is winter storage improvements, so it's additional ponds. Um, I wanted to walk you through the previous amendments to help understand why we need this third one. The first amendment related to understanding the need for storage being bigger than what we had originally planned. Uh, due to new processors and increased flow from existing processors. The second amendment was related to the acquisition process that we're having with USBR, which owns the parcels to the north and the south of our facility where we plan to install some of those ponds. And through that process with USBR, we learned that we needed an environmental site assessment. Um, so we amended the contract for including that work. And now we reach this new point where we are proposing to you a new amendment for their services, which is a consequence of having um, worked with USBR and identified an expedited process to go through their environmental process beyond just the environmental site assessment. This includes something like a NEPA <laughs> process with USBR, but there is an expedited process that allows us to meet our most critical time constraint in this project, yet on the other hand, it forces us to go back and redo some environmental processes with Ecology, who is funding this project. So should we have done a full NEPA with USBR, we wouldn't need to do um, the environmental process through the state, but because we're doing an, an abbreviated environmental process with USBR, we are required to go back to the state and do some additional work. So this includes additional um, reports and different forms that need to be filled out. So it's, a, it's kind of like duplicated efforts to fit the needs of both agencies. Besides that, we also, working with USBR, identified a fourth parcel. We were acquiring three parcels before, and uh, we have identified a nearby fourth parcel that would allow for our construction activities to um, ultimately incur less cost because we can dispose of some um, additional soil and use it for our staging and other things. Um, this, the process to acquire this fourth parcel from USBR could be extremely similar to the other three parcels. And so it seems reasonable and advantageous to do it all under one process. Uh, that's what USBR stuff uh, indicated in our uh, communication with them. And so we are proposing to expand the services that RH2 and RH2's consultants are providing us in order to take advantage of this opportunity and, and um, acquire that land for an ultimate benefit of the overall project. I'm happy to answer questions. There was a lot of information there. <laughs> Thank you for that presentation, Councilman Campos. I just want to I love this stuff. I just want to paraphrase. What I heard was is that you want to extend the contract because you have a critical path activity regarding your environmental services that if this is delayed, it'll delay you push your whole project completion date out. Okay. 
I just that, want to make sure. That is correct. So um, it's we had identified a process that was much longer before we could acquire the land and use that land. Right. Now there is a shorter process, but that shorter process, unfortunately, doesn't meet all the requirements of our funding agency. Correct. So there's, yes. Right. Two. But we'll keep the shorter, the shorter yes. one will keep you on the critical path as yes. opposed to. Any further questions or comments? Looks like there's no more questions or comments, so we'll see that on our next agenda. Moving along to item F, uh, two resolutions, project acceptance for, North, uh, for 20th Avenue Head Beacon Project, I'm assuming pedestrian. Uh, Beacon Project and Industrial Way Retrofit Project, Director Orley. Thank you again, Madam Mayor and Council. And guess what? I'm going <laughs> to turn this over to Maria. You will get tired of me tonight. <laughs> Quite a few items. So we are, good evening, Council and, and Mayor. We are presenting to you uh, for acceptance two projects that were recently completed. Uh, the first one, and I do have some slides with pictures, so I'm going to go there. Oh, yes. Perfect. So the first project that we will go over is the 20th Avenue Pedestrian Hybrid Beacon. Uh, this is a project that was developed in uh, coordination with CVC, and it provides pedestrian safe pedestrian crossing location between the campus and the housing development uh, across 20th Avenue. Um, as you may remember, we had an agreement with CVC in order to fund these improvements and all the development of the project was done jointly, although the city was uh, responsible for administrating the design and construction. Uh, this project was bid and awarded to uh, Ellison Earthworks and they have performed a great job for us, so I will Go forward with the picture, show you what it looks like. What you're seeing is the project location and the plans for the construction of that crossing. Um, and this is what it looked before the crossing existed. So there was not really a, a ADA compliant way of crossing between the, the campus and um, the housing right at the location where the, where the housing uh, leads to 20th. So there was a much longer path should you need ADA compliant facilities, but people tend to cross anyways where there is not enough room to cross and it's sometimes not safe. So this, this need was identified as the direct point of cross between the two facilities. And what you're seeing right now is uh, construction underway. Um, on one side, you're seeing all the work done uh, towards um, installing some conduit that was needed for fiber for CVC work and that portion of the work was fully paid by CVC. And then uh, on the second page, you're seeing the actual uh, beacon with the solar system. And then this is the final configuration. The project came in right under budget due to quantity adjustment. Um, and of course, it's a beacon that is uh, actuated by the pedestrians when, when it's needed. Otherwise, it allows for traffic to flow freely when there is no pedestrians needing to cross. Okay, and the next project is the North Industrial Way Stormwater Retrofit and Overlay. This is a project that was in our pavement preservation program as, as well as our stormwater needs. Um, this is a, a corridor that is industrial in nature and it serves lots of warehouses including food processors so there's a lot of heavy truck traffic along this road we had a uh, deficient pavement condition um, in part due to the failure of the stormwater facilities that were existing in that in that road and so the project really addresses the stormwater deficiency by installing new facilities so new catch basins and and infiltration trenches that are bigger than the original ones, and then uh, repaves the road in order to provide for a, for a adequate surface for the transportation of goods. And so this is the before pictures, which you can see how uh, the pavement was uh, 
getting deteriorated and it's worse as winters come and there's freezing and so on. So once, once you start seeing damage, you really need to take care of it and address the source of the issue, which was the stormwater. And then uh, this is during progress of the project. Uh, what you're seeing right there is the installation of either catch basins in one of the pictures or the storm uh, infiltration facilities back of, in the back of the curve. Um, this is a, a manhole where some of the sediments and if any sediments get into your system. So this is meeting all the regulations for stormwater. And here again, you're seeing some more construction related to the reconstruction of curve and rebuilding those uh, approaches to the existing facilities. And then here we're seeing more of the paving. You're seeing some gr grinding of the pavement on the edges so that we can maintain our uh, level at the, at the curve and gutter, and then the repaving you're seeing right there on the, this corner of the, of the screen, and then, of course, the rolling of the pavement afterwards. And there was also striping, which we didn't get a picture in this in this presentation, but the striping did happen. So it's all complete, and um, an overview of the construction. The, the construction was awarded for um, $503,000, and this was awarded to... Uh, double J excavating. And um, as you see, there were some adjustment for quantities first, so it was actually it cost a little less to do the job, but then there were some uh, change orders, minor change orders on things related to stormwater. Um, two were related to stormwater facilities needing to be either extended or needing to replace a whole catch basin instead of just behind the catch basin, the improvements added. And that is typically, uh, you discover that once you start digging and you see that you actually cannot connect to that catch basin if it's not in, in good enough shape. And then um, change order number two was related to, to an existing um, monument that needed to be reinstalled after the, after the construction started. So anyways, that's the total for change orders and this project is now completed and operational. <clears throat> Any questions or comments from Council? Mayor Vertemeloni. Thank you, Mayor Barajas. Uh, just one quick question. On that change order two, um, when I see the words installed properly, is this was it installed as part of the project or was that outside of this project? It was prior. Priorly installed, but it was not contained within within the casing that it needs to be. Great, thank you. Any further questions or comments? Looks like there's none. Um, I, for one, will say Thank you for putting a cross a crossing area uh, into the student housing. That's always a good idea. Thank you for that. Uh, moving on to item G, resolution amendment number two to the East UGA expansion sewer lid sewer lid scoping agreement with RH two. And again, Director Worley. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. I'd like to turn this over to Maria. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. Good evening again. Um, in this case, we are presenting to you a second amendment to our East UGA sewer expansion LID. Uh, this, this is a project that you may remember um, we recently, you recently formed the LID for the sewer expansion north of the um, of Burns Road um, between Road 68 and towards the east, right? Um, I wanted to start the presentation by letting you know that when we first sol solicited consultants to participate um, in a qualifications-based selection process, uh, we advertised our, our serv the services needed for this project as full engineering services, and uh, we opted to enter an initial agreement with RHU Engineering to help us move the project forward in a conceptual manner to support the formation of the LID should the formation happen. Um, we have performed that work. The original scope included also some permitting support to work with BNSF to uh, start those critical items on, on permitting to cross the BNSF railroad with, um, with some casings for the future installation of sewer. And uh, we recently executed Amendment number one, which reallocated some of the remaining funds in that original contract 
for moving forward some, again, critical items on timing-wise, on exploration such as survey and geo some geotechnical work that were critical to continue to move the project forward. We have some, some uh, deadlines that cannot be moved at this point. So um, that, that is the history on this, on this previous, um, previous scopes. And now amendment number two, you will see is much bigger in size, is for one point almost four million dollars. Um, and that, that is to perform the actual design. We are envisioning this design will happen as, as a big design that includes four bit packages at this point so that we can expedite construction of certain portions and move in a logical manner towards completing the whole scope of work. Um, Okay, that was probably long enough explanation, but I can answer any questions you have on that. Maria, before the questions, could you just talk about the four different uh, phases? Yes. Um, and then the reason we're pushing this schedule so hard. Yes, okay, so um, thank you. <laughs> the first phase could be to actually build the crossings under the railroad. So we have already started the permitting. Once that is allowed, we will get the allowance from the from the railroad to go do that and so we'll build those casings and install those casings under the second phase could be to build um, the the gravity main serving the derigal area and the lift station and force main so that way we can uh, bring uh, that sewer which has a, a firm deadline that must be met. And so we are pushing really hard to get that, that portion done in time. And then the next phases could be moving towards the west, building a mains that, you know, gravity towards that lift station first on, on a section and then towards the, more like the branches up into the rest of the UGA. And again, the, the timing is there is a big and it has been expressed the big need for the sewer in the area. And we also have the harsh deadline of their goal starting uh, operations by the end of 2023. So we are, we are moving this forward should you allow us to do full design. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Any questions or comments? Um, Mayor Portemaloni. Thank you, Mayor Barajas, and thank you for the for the reminder and the and, and the um, and how this plays in. Um, my only question is, um, whenever we see a, an amendment like this, I'm I'm very interested in seeing how this compares to our original plan. Um, so, how how does this amendment line up with line up with what we would have expected this cost to be, or we plan for this cost to be? After all, this will be um, cost out to the entire LID, and I know that's that's something that we've advertised a cost. It'll be finalized before before um, everything finishes. But um, how does this compare to what we expected? Uh, so this is actually within a reasonable range for cost of the LID. Typically, design costs are um, somewhere in the 8 to 12 percent, typically, <laughs> of construction costs. And so we're looking at a, at a construction cost of $25 million or so. So this is well under that typical cost. There are some efficiencies being gained by the fact that the previous development of this the conceptual development is... Um, done by the same consultant and, and it's all underway and previous experience from LIDs show that um, with all willing participants there are some efficiencies to be gained as you don't have to rework your, your design several times as you're cooperating with, with the property owners as you go. Okay, I appreciate that. Well, good luck with the railroad um, after the, our experience with Lewis Street um, overpass. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just wish you the best. Thank you. <laughs> And I would just add one additional thing. The original estimate for this project for the LID was actually higher than it is now because through the initial portion of developing the LID, we met with all the property owners and we were able to come up with an alternative design with some changes to the grading for some of the properties that eliminated another lift station that was originally proposed. And so we, we narrowed the scope down quite a bit and, and cut the project cost down, which I think allowed some of the property owners to agree that this is the, a good way to go with the LID. Okay. Does anyone want to turn? I think Steve captured it 
But yeah, I, I was going to say that our, our initial foray into that, I mean, you see that small number, and I knew that would be a question tonight, is uh, that was really more of an exploratory effort. We, we went through the same process we would uh, to hire an LID or, or an engineering firm to do an LID, but uh, we didn't authorize or come to council for, for the full um, amount because we didn't know at that time how things would kind of pan out, what it would look like. We, we had, uh, Steve had been uh, successful in working with uh, property owners out there to get them to, uh, to pony up for the uh, funding, the first part of this uh, exploratory work. And now it's, you know, as Steve, as Steve explained, it's uh, the, uh, the work uh, demonstrated that it was a very promising project and folks are interested in it and we're doing the whole LID now. Councilwoman Roach. Just want to say good job to staff. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you very much for your presentation. I look forward to seeing more of that here soon. All right, moving on to item H, resolution amendment to the WPWTP phase two scoping agreement with RH2. I, it's a shocker. <laughs> I'm going to turn this over to Maria. Miss Sarah. Final amendment for the night, for, for my projects at least. Um, so what we're presenting to you today is amendment number one for West Pasco Water Treatment Plant uh, Phase 2 expansion. And if you remember, we recently uh, uh, presented to you an award, a bid award, which passed. So. Um, we have Apollo uh, ready to start work on the site. They are already working already on phase one. Um, and this amendment to uh, professional services agreement is to have the support of our engineer of record during construction uh, phase for this project. They would be uh, supporting our staff on review of submittals and some inspections on site and some, some other um, change order approval and other things as we move forward. So um, you see this is a, as it's mentioned somewhere in the agenda report, it shows that the percentage of cost for the service is well below the standard for um, construction management during, during uh, construction phase. So uh, that's a pretty short explanation. This, this, I, I, that some this amount of cost was already accounted for in the in the budget for this project, so it doesn't have new impacts on the budget. Perfect. Thank you. Any questions or comments from council? <clears throat> Mr. Director Worley, your lights on. Do you I have, have nothing any to add. Comment? <laughs> Looks like there's no questions or comments. Again, we look forward to seeing that on our next agenda. Thank you. Um, Moving along, item I, recruiting firms for city manager position. Uh, Ms. Shapin. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor and uh, Council. Uh, you had asked uh, last week for some additional information uh, regarding uh, the process or different recruitment firms and how they may handle uh, the recruitment for the city manager. Interestingly enough, there's not a lot of history um, in regards to the hiring of city managers locally. Um, as uh, Mr. Zabel was the first new city manager to the city of Pasco in more than 30 years, so we really have no hiring history in regards to what we've done previous to his um, hiring uh, eight years ago. Um, and both of the other cities, really, do, uh, Kennewick, Richland, do not have any recent history either with city managers. I did reach out to a Walla Walla. They are in the process of recruiting for a city manager, but they um, have much more lead time than we do. They have um, a vacancy that's going to occur in March, so they have a lot of lead time to do some very uh, lengthy kind of processes to ensure the process that they want for their city manager. And um, so, Kennewick did respond. I did not, uh, was not able to get that information. It didn't come until today that 
they have used the Prothman Company. And I really believe that there's some confusion uh, when I spoke to the individual, uh, my counterpart in Walla Walla, <laughs> they talked about the Prothman Company, but that was Sonia Prothman, who is the owner of the Greg Prothman Company. And then we have Greg Prothman, who is the owner of the GMP Consultants. So not is everybody understanding, I think, the same um, firm when we're talking about Prothman because there being two different firms now in the state of Washington with um, the same, kind of the same name, but they do not have the same. There was a joint ownership of the Prothman Company. Now there's a separation between the Prothman Company and the, the GMP consultants. So our experience has been with, uh, with Greg Prothman. Uh, we have also had experience with Sonia Prothman and our recommendation is to go with the GMP because they are the they are the uh, the firm as I spoke last week that has really uh, broad experience in in filling positions here in Pasco as I indicated in the agenda statement since uh, 2000 uh, Mr. Zabel was hired in 2014 Ms. Sigdell in 2016 uh, Mr. Worley 2018 Chief Roski, 2019, and Adam or Mr. Lincoln in 2020, they have assisted us in that hiring, in those hiring processes. And getting into the details of the actual process itself is difficult to do when we have potential candidates um, that are here. We really like to keep that process fair and equitable for all, all individuals that uh, put in an interest in the city of Pasco. But Having a, a recruitment firm who does have their finger on the pulse in Washington is really critical. I looked at the uh, companies in which Walla Walla looked at and the individual uh, agency that they picked was Strategic Government Resources out of Texas. Um, I've had some training from the gentleman who is the, uh, the head of, of that uh, company, that recruitment company, I think they, they, are, um, they are very diverse in what they do. They do not focus uh, uh, specifically on recruitment. So I think that um, in the training that I've had, I think there's an interest, but I don't think that there's the, 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 sit, the state of Washington knowledge that we're really looking for when it comes to collective bargaining and employee relations, labor relations, and some of those uniquely Washington um, parts of what a senior manager needs to know uh, when we're looking at um, the importance of the job in which they do and the experience that they we would like to see come with the city. Um, we have another firm that was uh, primarily in California. I provided you a list of the recruitments that they had filled. I think there were maybe two that were not in California. So again, I think that they're looking for something very different um, than we are here in Washington when we want somebody that really understands the rules and regulations, the WACs and the RCWs of Washington, um, especially the, the interest arbitration and collective bargaining is very important for a city manager to have good experience with. And Washington is, is unique in that way because we do have such a strong uh, labor relations and collective bargaining rules in the employee's favor in the state of Washington. So looking at somebody from outside the state is difficult. I have worked with, um, not necessarily city manager, but particularly uh, department heads, police in, in particular, that come from outside the state of Washington and understanding the rules that the state of Washington expects from a leader is um, really important that we have that local Washington state knowledge. Um, so I would be happy to answer other questions if you have them. I just feel that, um, still feel strongly that the firm of GMP is going to provide the city with a timely and relevant process and um, recruitment that will be effective for us, for the city of Pasco. Thank you for that. Any questions or comments? 
Councilman Campos. Uh, thank you, thank you, Director Chapin, um, for the clarification on which GMP. So to be clear, a lot of my comments last week, looking back to the record, I, I dealt with uh, the Prothman Company, not GMP. I imagine since there's separation, a lot of the processes and policies are probably identical, anyways. And so I imagine there's probably no um, no real significant difference there. Um, I'm still of the mindset, you know, this is a big decision to make, and I think that it's important that we do it timely. And by dragging our feet and, and kind of expediting, by not expediting this, we really are doing the city a disservice. Um, and not just city, but our staff. Our staff is under a lot of pressure right now. You know, again, with the news today of, of you know, a director leaving, um, it's, it's a big deal. So um, I think it's important that we take what Director Chapin sang to heart and move on this. That. Any further questions or comments, uh, Councilman Brown? Um, just a few. Um, I concur with you um, on a much, you know, HR family here. We, I get it. I get what you're saying, but also the urgency of placement is growing every day. It looks like so. There, there's another layer to this. As of the last 24 hours, I read my emails. So if there is safety and um, working with this agency, there's there's some good history and working with this agency because of where we are now i would be most comfortable supporting um moving quickly um with them there is some safety in them i'm using that word strategically um so i do i concur with you a hundred percent i think um councilman compost is correct the urgency to care for and take care of pasco is at hand and i think we need to move swiftly smartly and strategically, but I, again, I concur with you and I repeat that for a lot of HR reasons and I think you follow me. So I appreciate um, the way you articulated this. I think you did an excellent job, so thank you. Any further questions or comments? Councilwoman Roach. My comments would just be to say that I, um, you know, city manager elevated to our, you know, our awareness that there's that level of burnout that happens with staff and I think that that is a legitimate uh, thing a risk that we run with extending the timeline of the process of hiring and then with leadership roles that already exist that need to be filled we can see the the actualization of that burnout being a real risk so um, I'm in agreement that going with a trusted um, Recruiting agency is probably the best uh, path forward, and I'm just wanting to get clarity that would be, because when I read the report with the two Prothmans, that would be the Greg Prothman. It would be the GMP, GMP. Co uh, consultants with the president as Greg Prothman. Okay, correct. Yeah, that's where I'm. I'm at with that. Thank you, um, Mayor Bertamaloni. Thank you. Um, yeah, the urgency has certainly escalated. I, I, I will just, I, I, I guess I have a little bit of built up frustration right now because I feel like we've been backed in, the council has been backed into having to make quick decisions on a number of things recently. Um, and you know, um, Mr. Zabel did announce his, his um, retirement day back in June. And so it took a month and a half to come in front of us. So it's one of those things where, um, you know, I, I would prefer in a number of areas if we could see about getting a little more lead time. A library contract was one of them where I felt we were in a, in a very tight turnaround. Um, you know, last week we heard that we couldn't possibly move forward with a ballot measure for, um, you know, to have people vote, potentially the, the citizens of Pasco vote on a, um, you know, potentially whether they would um, want to, move, uh, want to uh, approve marijuana retail sales. Um, you know, there's been, there's been a number of um, items where we've, we've been, I guess, forced to make a very quick decision on something that necess didn't necessarily have to be a quick decision. Um, I think uh, um, I think Greg Prothman will be a fine choice, and I am comfortable moving forward with that. Um, he has he certainly has the chops, um, but I, I do, uh, Director Chapin, want to ask you to see if you can clarify some of the comments you made um, when you talked about the deep Washington roots. Are are you suggesting that we shouldn't evaluate candidates that are outside of Washington State, um, like if we had a candidate from Oregon or Idaho, because. I guess what I heard from that was that we really need someone with lot, lots of Washington experience, um, not not as a for the city manager. Was that what you were saying, or were you saying something different? Someone that would have some 
um, experience understanding the labor laws and collective bar bargaining laws within the state of Washington is important. That's not to say that we wouldn't assess any of the candidates, and that's part of what our recruitment firm does for us is actually assess the experience of the individual that uh, submits for their applications and help screen down those qualified candidates so we can look at um, any of those qualified candidates that come forward. Uh, it's just that's been an area where uh, I've seen some individuals struggle if they don't have a, at least a, an understanding of what the laws are in Washington, not to say that they don't have some of those same laws in Oregon, less in Texas and, and California. But yes, we would want we want to do a you know send out a wide net of individuals that might be interested in um, our our position. But um, I think that we do look towards the importance of their the city manager's role when it comes to uh, representing the, the council and uh, at bargaining and, and that you know labor relations is really important um, part of their role with the bargaining groups. Well, I've certainly appreciated your leadership in our bargaining in the past as well, and I'm, I'm positive whatever city manager we end up picking that you'll be able to provide your expertise to help them through that process as well. Um, I, I guess I would, I would hate for, for us to get, our, get ahead of ourselves when we're in the choosing a recruitment firm stage to starting to set the criteria for the candidate in this public setting when there's a process for us to go through it for it. Now, ultimately, council gets to decide what's most important to us. So I just want to make sure that you know no one takes this meeting as a, oh, gosh, I'm from so and such and such place. I shouldn't even apply because um, Director Chapin just said that I need someone from Washington. So thank you for clarifying that to make sure I, um, I understand that better. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Councilman Campos. Um, no, never mind. I think I'll just muddy the waters. Good. Any further questions or comments? Thank you for the clarification, Director uh, Shapin. Um, I know we did, had requested you know, a little more research into other um, agencies. You've provided that, and you've again provided your input on um, best uh, options moving forward. Um, I think the majority of us are in agreement with um, going with with GMP, Mr. Greg Prothman. Um, so we'll again, look forward to um, seeing the development of this process. Yes, we hopefully to move quickly so that we can get uh, them out to interview with the council, interview with the directors, uh, members of the the public, and get a good scope of what it is the the council is looking for what the employees are are needing and what the public is needing so we'll be working on that right away to get them out to do thank those you. interviews thank you and i mean it doesn't hurt to reiterate there is a sense of urgency now um so we'll look forward to those next steps all um, right thank you for all the right. direction thank you again uh moving forward to um, item J on our agenda, last item on the agenda, resolution bid award for A Street Sports Complex Phase 1 Director at Cut. Yeah, thank you uh, once again, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> City Council has long determined the need for additional multi-sports use, multi-use sports fields as a priority in their council goals, um, specifically calling out additional soccer and sports fields uh, as one of its quality of life focuses uh, previously. Uh, with this goal in mind in 2018, uh, Pasco ACS staff applied for and were successful in obtaining a $350,000 youth athletic facilities grant from the state of Washington. Uh, funding from this grant became available in 2019. Beginning in 2019 and into 2020, architectural and engineering design work um, and necessary cultural resource survey were completed for this A Street project. Uh, the project went out to bid in 2021, but it had to be retracted because uh, there was some additional electrical requirements from Franklin PUD that we had to put in place uh, and, and work through the design. Those adjustments were made and uh, the project was put out for a, a bid the second time on uh, in May of 2022. And so as designed and as bid, the A Street Sports Complex Phase 1 um, will be on the uh, southeast corner of A Street and Elm Street, um, so east of the Oregon Avenue area. So this will be in, a, in, in the eastern side of Pasco. 
Um, phase one will include the extension of Elm Avenue south of A Street, um, providing access to the site, the extension of water and sewer services, undergrounding and extension of electrical, a parking lot for the soccer facility, pedestrian access path, drinking fountain, portable restroom shelter, and uh, is a sufficient enough playing space for three uh, full-sized rectangular multi-sport fields with a, a focus on soccer, but certainly conversion to other sports um, as well. This is the first phase of an ultimate build-out of 10 soccer fields for the community, uh, most notably in this, in this side of town as well, where they're lacking. Um, this is not our typical put down some sod and a couple of goals. We're really looking to design a, a parking, uh, parking space, um, and the ultimate build out for the 10 soccer fields would include permanent restroom facilities, uh, playgrounds, because not every kid in the family is playing a soccer game at that time. And as a parent of multiple kids, I know how that goes. Keep them entertained. Um, so at the call for bids, uh, bids were open on June 16th of this year. We received a total of nine bids. The lowest responsive bid was submitted by Big D's Construction in the amount of $1,173,199.10. That included Washington State sales tax. We also did the contingent bid addition for an additional electrical services um, that were necessary for the project. That was included in the amount of $141,310, which also included Washington State sales tax. Uh, bidder has demonstrated ability to meet the bid specifications, including experience on similar projects in terms of scope and size. Um, this is a long awaited project and uh, we're excited to kick off this first phase, no pun intended. Um, as we further our commitment to provide parks and facilities um, uh, to the community. So <clears throat> total project cost is uh, just over $1.3 million. And um, this is provided in part from the uh, RCO Youth Athletic uh, Facilities Grant from the state. And the rest of it will be funded through the Parks Development Fund. So at this time, we'll take any questions. Thank you. Any questions or comments? <coughs> uh, Councilwoman Roach and then Councilman Campos. Will you just take a comment? Sure. Great job on the to ACS staff on the grant. Um, I remember you when I got my tour when I first got on the council. You gave me that tour of A Street and where the planned um, sports complex would be in soccer fields. And so I was excited about it then. Still excited about it now. Know it's something that we need. And so love seeing this come to fruition every step of the way. So great job. Thank you. This is actually directed at Councilman Roach. Didn't we work on this on um, Planning Commission? But I thought it was at Road 100. We worked on one for like the Road 100 area, I thought. And it never, I don't believe it ever came to fruition. But I'm super excited to see that at least something still came of it. And um, that was club soccer. That's right. It's different. <laughs> so again, I just can't echo enough what Councilman Roach has said. This is great for all the youth in the um eastern pasco side and i know that you know they utilize every field space i think we can get a hold of i know mayor pro tem maloney made a point that uh edgar brown is frequently closed and so i'm always seeing kids scale the fence to go down there and play soccer which i'm, I'm all in favor of stop at nothing to do what you love right um and uh so yeah I, i'd love to see this utilized great job zach Thank you. any further comments mayor pro tem maloney I won't, won't pile on too much, agree with everything that was said there, um, but the only question I have for you, uh, Director Ratkai, is will any of the um, fields in the full, uh, when it's full bill out done, will any of them be lighted? Um, we're considering our future capital improvement plans, and that, that'll be coming up in the, the coming weeks. Um, I believe we have some intent for uh, a lighted field with artificial turf as well, so uh, that should help with year-round usage and, and certainly the water conservation. Great. I remember um, having the presentation from I think Visit Tri Cities about um, you know the, the sporting complex um, in essence our fields there on uh, Burden and how important it would be at some point in time to convert some of those to field turf and get lighting in and 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 do the whole package. Yeah. The dollar sign was large um, and not something that I would necessarily that that we necessarily had agreement that we could stomach. Um, but if we can do some of those same things here, that would be just fantastic. Not not perfect, but part of the overall package. So I appreciate that thought. Thank you. Certainly. Any further questions or comments? My last comment is that I'm excited to see this project in this area in particular. Um, I know a lot of the kids and families from this particular area uh, sometimes don't have transportation to go to, what is it, Road 36? 
uh, to the soccer fields out there. And so bringing the fields to, to them is a great accomplishment. Thank you again. Thank you for the grants. Um, I'm excited to see this one. You're welcome. Thank you again. And so we'll move forward with our agenda. Um, we're done with all our articles on here. Um, item six, miscellaneous council discussion. Any council discussion, city manager? None this evening. None this evening, moving right along. <laughs> item seven. I have a question for city staff. Yes. I know we participated in a survey for a board retreat. Um, did the date, did we come to consensus on a date? I didn't catch that. Uh, I actually spoke with April on that earlier, and I think the date that everyone was available, and Adam, correct me if I'm wrong, September 15th, does that sound about right? 15th or 16th? Yeah, let me take a quick look at a calendar. I'm pretty sure it was on a Friday. 16th, yeah. I'm pretty sure I wasn't available on the 16th. I plan on celebrating my 40th birthday party really hard that day. <laughs> <laughs> so... Okay, I may I'm not be remembering saying, that quite right, you, so I, I yeah, will. I mean, you can join me, but I don't want to talk city stuff. Yeah, I'll, con I'll confirm with uh, April in the morning and get get out to council. Okay, all right, we'll get confirmation on that date. Any further questions, councilman? Just uh, last comment. So uh, to piggyback off, you said that some kids don't have transportation to the Road 36 area. Um, I shared this with Tierra Vida, and I'm going to share it for our packed crowd tonight with all the kids or anybody who's probably not listening tonight. Um, BFT, free kids pass, uh, 18 and under, go get your passes. You can get them online or go to BFT and get them. Um, utilize them for as long as you can. That's all. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Mayor Bertamaloni. Thank you, Mayor Brahas. Just real quick, um, maybe this is for uh, Mr. Ferguson. Um, I know we've had some discussion about, um, you know, evaluating what's coming up with uh, the request from that we're getting from the community to um, revisit our cannabis um, retail sales ban. I, I think we had some some timing that we were going to get a legal analysis on that. I, I, I think that was today, but I know that you were under a tight crunch on that, so I'm not trying to hold you to that date. I'm just kind of trying to get an idea of what's, what's the timeline look like. What's next? Uh, yes, yeah, so that was uh, Mr. Zabel who uh, committed me to that timeline, so uh, no, I'm teasing. Uh, yeah, no, we, uh, uh, we, we do have st stuff prepared. Uh, it just hasn't been finalized, but right. we'll get it to you this week. Okay, great. Thanks. I just wanted to make sure that we're that I understand where our path is. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. And Bill, I'll just add that the plan was to bring that to your next uh, workshop. So, our, so our, our two weeks Not from this tonight. One. Next one. Yeah, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. I thought we were going to have a legal analysis first, and then we were going to get the um, um, something from oh, Director uh, White um, for our workshop meeting on the public portion of the workshop. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Appreciate it. So, so we're. So so the community should be expecting further discussion at not next week, but two weeks from two weeks from tonight will be a I'd larger workshop week. discussion on it at our next workshop. Meeting. Yeah, I think next week, next week we should be able to have a discussion uh, with the attorney on the legal aspects of it in executive session. And then we'll have the public portion the following week at workshop. Great. Thank you. I'm just and trying to make sure I know we have some interested okay. members of the community. And I'm just trying to make sure I understand the timeline. I clearly did not. Thank you. Appreciate it for uh, helping me. Yeah, it, probably my con my fault for confusing. I thought we were, yeah. uh, September thirtieth was the date that everyone was available. Sorry, my apologies. Yippee, Skippy. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, any further questions or comments? All right. Um, moving along to item seven, executive session. Any need for executive session? Not this evening. Perfect. Um, and it is now 8.43, and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone.